Darkling Closure. Welcome, everybody, to The Birders Show. Uh, joining me live from Medellin, Colombia, we've got Diego Calderon. Diego, how are you? Good morning, mate. How is it going? Very good here. What about you? Not too bad, not too bad. Well, as you know yourself, yesterday, both of us had quite the birding adventure. We'll get to that later on, so still kind of buzzing from that. Um, but I should welcome our special guest to the studio. Uh, joining us all the way from Rutland in the United Kingdom, we have uh, Tim Appleton. Tim, welcome to The Birders Show. Hi, hi, Chris. Hi, Diego. Good to be with you. It's, it's amazing. You know, there we are, uh, 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 an ocean apart, and yet, you know, it feels that we're in each other's uh, room. So thank you for inviting me. Really looking forward to chatting and hearing about this special day yesterday. Okay, yeah, we'll get, we'll get to the special day yesterday. It's, um... Take it easy. We don't want to brag too much. <laughs> <laughs> But then having said that, I follow Tim on Twitter and his Twitter feed is a constant stream of incredible backyard birds that he has just in Rutland Water Reserve in his backyard. So I can't, I'm not going to let him feel, I'm not going to feel too bad for Tim, let's put it that way, because he has a pretty great backyard list compared to me. Um, and speaking of Rutland Water, I think that's as good a place as to start as any. Uh, Tim, that was, well, I'm looking at your biography here and uh, you started out your birding journey as deputy curator at Slimbridge. Um, but I want to rewind a little bit from that and just ask you the question that we ask everybody who comes on the show. How, how did you fall in love with birds? What was your, your beginning in this world? I, I was lucky. I, I lived, although I lived in the heart of a city, it was on the edge of a huge golf course. And I remember one of the most amazing moments of my childhood was finding a nightjar's nest about three miles from the center of Bristol. And it was in an area of uh, beautiful habitat that was still unspoiled. Now, obviously, that's all gone. But it, it did sort of fire me off. And I used to collect eggs, dare I say. You know, well, it used to be done. It's the only way you could actually really connect with uh, wildlife. Um, there weren't the books. You had to, you took one egg and you blew it and it stood proudly in your little box. I would also even pick up like dead birds and cut their wings off to identify, you know, the wing. So it, it, this was how it was in those days. You know, you think back another century ago, um, nobody had binoculars. How did they identify them? They shot them. So, you know, we have moved on a little bit. And, but that really triggered my um, real passion for birds. But also, I live very closely to Sir Peter Scott's Wildfowl Trust at Slimbridge, which is where I started my career, as you quite rightly say, Chris. And uh, my mum and dad used to drop me off there um, as a kid, and I would sort of go around with my mouth open looking at all these wonderful ducks and geese and swans, and I'd peer across to a place called the Rushy Pen. And that's where Sir Peter, or Peter Scott as he was when I first arrived, would sit there with his paintings and uh, looking out into the Rushy Pen. And I thought, wow, that's what I need to do. This is what will fire me for the future. And it really has happened. It, it's been an incredible journey. And uh, my journey has ended up here in Rutland. Um, and I have my own rushy pen, uh, as you said just now, looking out. I can see, <laughs> I see hundreds of birds every day and all sorts of wonderful things. So, uh, that's the journey. That's the journey. It sounds like a pretty good journey. And like you said, quite rightly, you probably have one of the best backyard bird lists in the UK, I think, I would imagine, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, this year alone, I've seen 103 different species uh, from the garden. And missing quite a lot because the 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 Quebec garden looks over a, 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 lo a large part of the Rutland water, which is a reservoir. Now, normally reservoirs go up and down, and in the uh, by the autumn, often they're quite low. Uh, well, this year we've had a, a mixed weather. We haven't had the very dry weather, so the reservoir level is quite high. So I'm missing some of the obvious waders. But yeah, I mean, the greatest thing the other day. I came back from watching uh, and some, we were doing some moth trapping and I was with a colleague and uh, he, he walked into the garden just ahead of me and he went, oh, what the heck's that? And <laughs> coming towards him was a buzzard being chased by a jackdaw. And then he looked wow. again 
bloody hell. Sorry, excuse my French. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a white tailed seagull being chased by a raven. And this is one wow. of the reintroductions that are happening down in the south of Britain. And it's been, as a juvenile, it's been wandering around the country. But I mean, what a great tick to have in your garden, a white tailed seagull, you know, in the middle of the Britain, England. Well, that, actually, that you're amazing. talking about the, you talking about the eagle and the the reintroduction scheme kind of brings me on quite nicely to one of the things that we wanted to talk to you about today, which is the Rutland Water Osprey Project, which is probably one of the most iconic reintroduction bird schemes in the world, it would be fair to say. Um, and I, I, I think looking at the dates here, you started that project in about 1996. Now, I would have been eight years old at the time and <laughs> desperately daydreaming of seeing an osprey because for me back then, and it's hard for a lot of birders in countries where the osprey is a relatively widespread bird, such as Colombia, where we are now, that the osprey was a, a mythical bird for me in the mid 90s as a young birder. It would have involved a long road trip that my parents weren't willing to take to Loch Garten Reserve in Scotland, or the biggest stroke of luck going in the West Midlands to come across an osprey. So that project, how, how did that project first come about? Because in the mid 90s, that must have seemed to a lot of people like a kind of mad dream that would n stand no chance of succeeding. How did you, how did you come to, to bring that project to life? Well, I've had lots of mad dreams in my life, Chris. And, uh, <laughs> This is one that actually did come true. <laughs> uh, basically, again, out of my back garden in 1994, I saw uh, an osprey and it actually landed on a tree opposite the garden. I thought, wow, that's amazing. Because I'd already, would you believe, put, made some polystyrene ospreys and stuck them up in some trees to see whether on passage they would migrate through and stop. <laughs> But of course, they took one look at these and thought, what the hell am I going to do here? I'm just going, I'm going back to Scotland. So anyway, I abandoned that idea. And say so this bird arrived, a young female. And then about a week later, another bird arrived, which I assumed was a male. And they stayed all that uh, summer. And I thought, well, that's it. Obviously, you know, they'll come back next year. And wow, that's going to be great. So I introduced a guy called Roy Dennis, who's one of the world, if not the world's expert on ospreys lives in Scotland, very much involved, as you mentioned just now, on the Lock Garden Project. And so he came down and we looked at the site and he said, you know, this is an amazing place. You know, it has lots of fish in the reservoir. There's lots of uh, wonderful old trees in the area. Um, what we could do is do some sort of transportation program. I said, well, what do you mean? You know, well, actually bring birds from somewhere else? He said, well, it's an idea I've had. And I think it's a sort of idea that could just work. So in 1996, we brought uh, the first th uh, six birds down from Scotland. And then in 97, as the project really got established, in the next five years, we brought uh, 12 birds as they were five weeks old, taken from specific nests that we could identify would be safe to take the birds from, probably because there were three chicks in the nest. And then the great magical moment for me was in 1999 when uh, 083, or as we used to call it, uh, came back the first time. This was a bird that would have gone to West Africa. It would have probably gone to Senegal or Gambia, spent nearly 18 months, two years there before it returned. And what we'd learned from Roy particularly was that young male ospreys, when they fledge, will virtually always come back to the site where they did fledge. And this is exactly what happened. A few weeks later, I was wandering around in one of the local woods overlooking the site, and I came across uh, the bird actually making a nest. The next moment in, in the year um, 2000, um, a female arrived, he paired up with a female. They didn't nest that year, but they were a very young pair. But then in 2001, the magic moment, I came up and found the female on the nest and the rest is history. Now uh, we've had more than 170 young chicks reared uh, around the reservoir and in the locality. Uh, some of our birds have actually moved out to Wales and into the Lake District in the UK. So, you know, it's been an amazing success. It's quite a remarkable story. And going back to what I said at the very beginning, an eight-year-old me, desperate to see an osprey at the time, could never have imagined that all those years later we'd have had 170 pairs fledged. And I've been to see ancestors of the Rutland ospreys in Wales and in the Lake District since then. So I've, I've, I've ticked off my UK life at osprey, <laughs> thanks, thanks in that. part to that project.
So Diego, we've just been talking about ospreys. I don't know if you you have any uh, background as as our resident ornithological expert on the show. If you have any information about ospreys, anything interesting that we can uh, that we can share with the viewers. I tell you, one of these you know beautiful raptors that is pretty over uh, widespread over the planet, and I love you know this is a very old book, you know uh, water bird guide uh, from Maudouin, but it shows ospreys of course, and I I was struck by two things. It used to be called fish hawk that I would love to hear about, you know, from Tim, if he knew this. And, you know, they said these ospreys could live for 21 years. And one of the things that strikes me is that most ospreys, at least in Colombia, that you see, they come migrating, but if they stay year round is because they are juveniles on their first year. So that's, that's, that's pretty lovely because it's this migratory bird that spends a full, full year in their, you know, wintering grounds in the tropics. And this kind of makes it our bird too. So actually, I, I wanted to hear from Tim if he knew about this, you know, beautiful fish hawk name. You know, this is this old book, pretty neat old stuff that we're going to actually use to introduce our, our, our birding topic from yesterday's adventure. What do you know, Tim, about the fish hawk? Yeah, absolutely, uh, Diego. I mean, it's um, a bird that was heavily persecuted in the UK and probably other places, particularly in medieval times and later. And this is why uh, it disappeared in the UK. Uh, it was taking fish from uh, fish farms and medieval ponds that provide protein and fish for the big families. So they were always hunted. Uh, the gamekeeper was given money uh, if he took the head and the beak uh, of the bird to the landlord. And of course, the, the birds disappeared. So my birds coming back were the first birds breeding in England for 150 years when we had the first bird, when I found this one in 2001. So yeah, it's a great bird. There are literally two or three different species, although for me, they all look identical. The American osprey is a different species from the European osprey. And it's found on all the planets except Antarctica. So yeah, it's a great um, global bird, a glo great global icon bird for me. And am I, am I right if I suppose that your European and Asian ospreys also spend their first full year as juveniles in their wintering grounds in the tropics, aren't they? Ab absolutely, yeah. I mean, our birds will stay there for one or even two years before they return. So they're literally... They're going down to West Africa, the Gambia, Senegal, Mauritania, places like this, and they spend very lazy time. In fact, uh, through our satellite tracking, one of our regular birds goes to the same tree each winter. It sits there uh, for uh, the whole day. It fishes maybe twice. It comes back again, sits there until the morning, goes out fishing, comes back, and that's all it does. It never moves almost for nine months of the year or six months of the year, and it migrates back from uh, from Africa. It takes about two weeks. Amazing. Incredible bird. To be fair, I mean, sitting in the exact same place all day, just eating and, and resting, sounds like a lot of human teenagers that I've come across. It doesn't sound that different to me when I was a teenager, so we've got some things in common there. What do I do? What do I, what do I do? <laughs> <laughs> so Tim, I know that throughout your birding life, as we've said, you've had a fascination with, with water birds, with ducks and geese. Um, and I also know from talking to you about it that you've seen virtually all of the species of ducks and geese that there are to see in the world. And actually, you've seen so many that it's easier to ask you of the ones you haven't seen than it is to ask you the ones that you have seen. How many species of, of ducks and, and geese haven't you seen? Are there any? Uh yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've got, I've seen all the swans. I've got okay. one goose left in the world to see. Um, the emperor goose. I've just never been that far north. And then I've got uh, 12 ducks to see. So, you know, I'm getting near the end. I think there's 162 species globally. So I'm getting there. Um, now, there is one duck, of course, that some people will definitely question whether I really ever did see it. And that's the wonderful pink-headed duck. Uh, which is considered now possibly extinct, I will remain and go to my grave saying that I saw the pink-headed <laughs> duck uh, on uh, one of our expeditions searching for that bird in Myanmar or Burma. What are you talking about, mate? What are you talking about? Oh, there's, there it is, the proper bird. What? Excellent. What are you talking oh. about? And it, let us, I mean, let us know more because look at the book where oh, I found it. it. <laughs> extinct birds, tell us more. It's literally in a book called Extinct Birds. That's hilarious. <laughs> I, I, 
I mean, like, you know, I can tell you, Chris and myself probably uh, a year ago went looking for a bird that was extinct, the Antioquia brosfinch. And, you know, it was yep. rediscovered and it's been properly documented now. And we went together, you know, with some more guys from Where Next and, you know, yeah. beautiful crew. But, you know, and we were, I love watching this bird while it was singing because it was like, wow, we can hear this from, from you know, it was gone. And what, what's... What's what's extra about your story of pink-headed goose? Ep uh, sorry, pink-headed dog. I mean, this thing is considered extinct. Let us know. It's exciting. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's it's just an amazing story. I mean, we were in the really remote part of uh, Burma, and uh, we went. Uh, we were on, on our fourth or fifth day of the expedition, and suddenly we're on this massive wetland. And to our right, um, a little flock of birds got out. Uh, some spot Indian spot build ducks, they're called. And one bird was totally different and came towards us. And we all went, oh, my God, it's a, uh, it's a pink-headed duck. <laughs> now, and then we saw it fly around. It split off from the other birds and then landed in this massive great wetland. Um, we then sort of hired young guys to go out you know, on elephants and stuff to look for these birds and for the bird. We never saw it again. And, of course, now people start saying, well, did we really see it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe it was just a trick of the light. I know what I saw. It's up here. It's up here, and it'll stay up there. How many? How many people? Uh, only three of us were there. It is obviously incredibly rare, and maybe it is extinct now. Maybe it, 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 the last ones uh, have gone, but they were. But you never know. But you never know. They could be still thriving on some, you know, little inlet. It's like Colombian grief. Is 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 officially extinct? This grief that we used to have in Colombia. Last report, 1976, 78. But who knows? It might be still thriving in, in a little isolated mountain lake, you know? I'm, I'm of the camp that likes to believe that these things are still out there. I yeah. hold out the hope that there's still an ivory billed woodpecker somewhere in a swamp in Arkansas, yeah. and exactly. that the pink headed duck is still out there on the border of Mongolia or Myanmar or something. It's, it's nice to have that romantic sense that there's parts of our planet that we haven't fully explored yet, and that there's things that we don't entirely understand. That's nice, I think. And going, um, going, going with your lines, Chris, look at what this says about pink-headed dog. No other local water bird acquire quite the mystique of the pink-headed dog, whose comparative rarity and most peculiar appearance made it highly soft after. That, that applies to all the, you know, gone, extinct, romantic, cool, exciting things you just mentioned. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, it, it, it's a question I wanted to ask Tim, because living in Colombia, I've noticed that ducks and water birds in general are not as beloved here in Colombia by birders as they are in, in Europe. People here, and, and I think actually Diego, in a little video that we're going to show you later, says the exact words, I don't really care about ducks, mate. That's a direct quote. <laughs> Shame upon oh, you. Excuse me, excuse know, me, right? excuse me. You should leave, <laughs> exactly. Diego, you should leave. I mean, Slimbridge is a great example of that uh, way to build a connection with people in the natural world because i mean i'm my family and i we're members of the wwt we often go down to slimbridge and we're birders so we're pretty quick into the hides but i love wandering through the pens and just seeing this kind of remarkable array of global wildfowl that you have there and it, and it does it gives you that little spark and that excitement think wow I, what i wouldn't give to see that bird in the wild which leads me on to my next question for you is you've got 12 more species of duck to see around the world What's, what's top of that list? What's the one that's really keeping you up at night? Well, the, I think the problem with most of the ducks that I now need to see live on the most remotest of islands, probably almost inaccessible, certainly inaccessible from my wallet's point of view. Um, <laughs> so I've got to be realistic. Now, there are two birds I, I would love to see, both of which I've actually reared in captivity, which is the crazy thing about it, when I actually worked at Slimbridge. Uh, I've never, ever seen a spectacle either. Now, I mean, what a spectacle no. that bird is at the best of times. Mm. So, you know, I desperately need to go. Now, that's relatively easy because I can hopefully get emperor goose at the same time. So that ticks off two more. The other two birds that should be, again, relatively easy, I just haven't bumped into them when I've been in that part of the world, the scaly side in Maganza and bears pochard. Now, the other bird which really frustrated, frustrates me is a bird in a way that's come back from being considered extinct. And that's the Madagascan pochard. Now, I went to Madagascar, I mocked up on all the birds in Madagascar, all the, all the water birds, and then about a year later, they rediscovered the Madagascan pochard. So I've either got to get on a plane, 
go all the way back there, or actually go down to Slimbridge, where they're doing an amazing job reintroducing or breeding these birds in captivity for release back into Madagascar to build up the populations. But I think probably I'll go to Madagascar. It's a, it's a little longer, a uh, little bit more expensive, but wow. Well, <laughs> a little, other good- little muddier. If I could just say one more thing. I mean, one of the great things about uh, Slimbridge is the fact that you can look at a species that is becoming uh, relatively rare, like the Madagascar poplar. But I go back another 40 or 50 years when the Hawaiian goose was down to probably 40 birds left in the world. And three birds were sent over, uh, considered initially to be um, uh, a, uh, a, a pair, I think, and a, or maybe a male and two females. And when, of course, when all three laid eggs, they thought, ah, we've got so- something slightly wrong here. So another male bird was <laughs> sent over. And the whole story has now gone way, way round. Uh, in Maui and places like that in Hawaii, there are thousands of these birds. And I was lucky enough to be invited uh, a couple of years ago to the Hawaiian Birding Festival, where I gave a sort of lecture about my work with Hawaiian geese. But I went up and I was so, so excited about seeing them in the wild because this was going to be my uh, last but one goose. So we trundled off into the countryside. And where do I see the first of them? Sitting on the golf course. Oh, my gosh, you know, what, what's going <laughs> wrong here? But I did get to see them in the wild <laughs> later on. But, you know, it's a great, great story and probably one of the proudest ones that uh, people like Sir Peter Scott, who actually, you know, was behind this right from the beginning has done some amazing work. So really exciting stuff. Okay, so speaking of long journeys to see geese, that actually brings us on quite nicely to the connection that the three of us have, uh, which is a bird called the Orinoco goose. Um, so I remember the first time that you and I met, Tim, was at the South American Bird Fair in Manizales in 2018. And you mentioned casually at the time that the one duck and goose species in South America that you had yet to see was the Orinoco goose. And I remember at the time I'd heard tell of an Orinoco goose that had turned up in a park not far from where we were we were in Pereira in the Colombian coffee region. So at the time we put you into contact with someone to go and see that. You went and saw it and were reasonably enough a little bit skeptical as to its origin. It, it had the feel of a bird that may have escaped from a nearby water park. It didn't have the... Uh, the, the scent of the wild on it, shall we say. Um, and so fast forward a little bit later to 2019 at the Columbia Bird Fair in Cali, where Diego also was. And Diego and I had just come back from a trip in the Colombian Plains region to a reserve called Altagracia, where we'd submitted to eBird a list that included, amongst other things, 2,000 plus Orinoco geese. And I remember you sent me a message, <laughs> which um, was about three o'clock in the morning, my time, and I was in my house and I received a message where you basically said, is this real or is this a joke? 2,000 Orinoco geese. And I said, no, 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 it's, it's real. There's a reserve where something like 33% of the global population is found. Um, so fast forward to just after the Columbia Bird Fair and you yourself went off on the Cessna airplane from the airport two hours into the middle of the plains to see these geese, which were your last species in South America. So, uh, well, what are your memories of that trip? Ah, where would you like to start? I mean, the first memory <laughs> is actually the bird that you mentioned, first of all, the uh, from Minizales, um, that I got so excited about seeing. And there it was, sitting on a, a, ped- a, pedal- a pedalo uh, next to about half a dozen uh, Muscovy ducks. I, I, I've tried to show uh, a degree of enthusiasm for it um, with the two guys who had taken us down there. And then when they said, I said you know, does it come here often? They said, yeah, well, it pops over from the zoo next door. So that was oh, it. No. I thought, oh, OK, uh, that's not really going to be my proper bird. But as you say, the, ne- the next story was just brilliant. We, we, we had to do all sorts of wonderful things. I wish Penny was here to tell you that, but how she managed to sort of conjure up flights out of nowhere and we ended up flying up to uh, Bogota, uh, uh, from Bogota to Yopal, and then hiring this little plane. Now, that's okay, that's brilliant, except, uh, you know, having arrived early in the morning, we uh, got on, uh, uh, weighed us and did all the things they needed to do. The little Cessna arrived, a super pilot got out, she uh, uh, showed us what to do, we strapped up, uh, got to the edge of the uh, runway, I started trying to use the radio. The radio had failed. Said, oh, cracky, we've got to do it all the way back again. So we went back to the airport, got out. She said, I'll go and get another plane. Absolutely fine. Ten minutes later, she's trundling down towards us. We get back into the plane with all our camera gear, binoculars, telescopes, get to the edge of the 
uh, runway, start going down the runway with fuel just coming all over the windscreen, which we couldn't see anything. <laughs> and they'd forgotten to take put the uh, petrol cap back on when they <laughs> filled the plane. So we were thinking, hmm, is this third time lucky or should we actually abandon um, the whole thing and go back to Bogota and go back and uh, dream of the... Uh, 2,000 birds that you had seen a few weeks before. <laughs> anyway, the story is brilliant. And I, I, you, I really owe you guys, you know, a, a death due to gratitude for that because it was fantastic. You know, as we landed, we could see these geese, literally, as you say, thousands of them in all states, in, in uh, like breeding pairs with young, uh, in molt, um, and greeted by the most wonderful people. And I believe you, I think you remember telling us, uh, Chris, that, uh, Penny and I were probably only about the fifth or sixth um, people from Europe to ever have been to this particular site. So, you know, it was a real honour. And thank you guys for, for helping us, me share one of my greatest experiences with. And mm -hmm. the lovely thing is, one of my great friends, John Cox, um, unbeknown to me, Penny had arranged for a, a picture uh, to be painted of the Orinoco geese. Well, look at it. And actually, speaking of pictures of Orinoco geese, I'm looking right now at the photo of you giving the thumbs up in front of seven or eight Orinoco geese on the lakeshore here. And that is yeah, quite the smile on your face. And also, I believe yeah. we can cut now to some footage of that Diego filmed in the exact same space when he and I went there to that reserve of these thousands of Orinoco geese. I don't know, Diego, if you have anything to say about that, that reserve, that experience. I should add that both Laura and Daniel, your operator and your guide team, and, you know, they were the same for us in our farm trip there. They were super excited and, and, and super amazed to, to see the excitement and the craziness of both, both of you guys, you know, Tim and Penny just going for these species. They were absolutely, totally in love of you guys. And, you know, as, as, as you say, Tim, this, this is a rather new place. It's called El Lagunazo. It's in the heart, in the middle of the Janos, and it's actually one of the most spectacular. And I'm, I think Chris, Chris is a is a Janos lover. He's a is a Eastern Plains lover. This is the most spectacular Janos place we've we've been in. You know, it's it's like deer everywhere and curassows and the dogs. We made we made the first record of the point tail palm creeper for the Casanare department. I mean, we love that trip. It's an amazing area. People who haven't been there don't quite appreciate the scale of the place because the Llanos is, you know, in, in, in England, we maybe don't have wilderness on quite that level, you know, where you're just so far from anything. And when you fly in over that plane and just see these, it's almost unfair to call them flocks because at that point they don't have their flight feathers. So they're, they're more like herds of Orinoco geese just kind of moving across the plains. It's, it's quite a remarkable experience. And, and actually, as Diego pointed out, we made the first record of point tail palm creeper for Casanare on our first trip. And we actually registered another population within the same reserve, but at a different site with my parents uh, 12 months later. So cool. there's so many cool. secrets, secrets to find on that reserve, so many interesting species to spot. Um, and speaking of interesting species, that means that I'm going to be co-author of a paper with your parents. I like it. I like the idea. Yeah, yeah it's going to be my first ever published paper as well when we finally get around to publishing it, which we, we need to do. But that's a separate thing. Um, <laughs> But speaking of, of amazing species of ducks and geese, that brings us on quite nicely to a little surprise that we prepared for Tim for this episode. Because when we knew that you were coming on, Tim, we knew that your kind of birding quest around the world is to spot all the species of ducks and geese. And Diego and I sort of thought, right, we can't bird together. We're living in separate parts of Colombia. Travel's difficult at the moment. How can we go off and spot an interesting species of duck or goose that Tim might be might be interested by. And we were sort of comparing notes and it was like, what species of duck in Colombia that's realistic have neither of us seen yet? And we settled upon masked duck. It's a species that maybe, I think there's maybe 250 records of on eBird for Colombia. Not many when you consider how many eBirders there are in the country. Um, so we both realized that we were both within probably an hour's drive of a possible masked duck. So yesterday at the same time, we set off on a little kind of dual bird quest to try and see for both of us a lifer, the masked duck. And we have a little bit of video of that experience to show you now. So we're here in La Sabana Eco Park, which is a reclaimed wetland reserve just north of the city of Bogota. It's a really inspiring project because it just goes to show that in as little as five years, you can take what was basically an ecologically dead cow field and turn it into a thriving local nature reserve and that you don't need thousands of hectares to do that. 
So right now, I'm looking at a family of masked ducks. That was the duck that we came here to see. It's a lifer for me, because I know for a fact that it's a lifer for Diego. And the thing that's amazing about the masked duck is that it's not considered threatened. It's not even really considered rare. It's present throughout the entire tropical Americas. And that's because this duck, as we've seen here today, has an amazing talent for invisibility. It has this incredible ability. It rides very low in the water. It's very shy, it's very unobtrusive, doesn't make a lot of noise. And when it hears you coming, senses your presence, it disappears off into the aquatic plants. I would hazard a guess that even Tim, the master of ducks and geese, hasn't seen masked duck chicks at such point blank range. Tim, maybe you can, you can prove me wrong on that. Oh, chicks, oh, even better. With chicks, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. That's some, something I've never seen. Obviously, I've seen the adults, but those chicks, look at the little stiff tails. They are just amazing. It's a great family, that the, the mast and the oxyurine. You know, they're just fabulous little things. Wow. And Diego, I know that Diego also had some luck on his quest for the mast duck. Is that right, Diego? I had, I had. Not, not as, you know... Uh, numerous as you but i had i had I, I actually had a little expedition 10 kilometers from my house went to a forest wetland nothing there you know the, the most likely place and then i started checking on eber and seeing coordinates of all these other reports and i went on my motorbike exploring these places finally got a couple of beautiful females loved it but i'm super jealous about your male and your chicks absolutely yeah <laughs> this is the little swamp only 10 kilometers from my house where the mask ducks have been seen recently. Well, I have to say that these Fulbus whistling ducks are super neat. But apparently, I'm not having any luck today. Let's see. I'll keep, keep trying here. This is a not great a uh, swamp just inside Rio Negro city and it's almost 1 p.m. and I just I just winged it and came to this other place because I knew there was one report on Iber here and there it is masked duck <laughs> this is epic same day Chris Bell and myself are getting lifer masked ducks and this is unbelievable unbelievable this is for you, Tim Appleton. This is for you, a gift for you, mate. Okay, so speaking of uh, birding spots close to Bogota, uh, yesterday when I was there in the eco park looking for the masked duck, it got me thinking about places where I can take part in an upcoming birding event, which I know that Tim, you'll be keen to talk about because it's your event. The Global Bird Weekend is fast approaching. I believe the weekend of the 17th and 18th of October. This is your new project, the thing you're very excited about. So please t tell us, what, what, what is the Global Birding Weekend? Yeah, well, thanks. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm so excited about this. Um, it's really bringing together my whole sort of passion for people, for people and wildlife. Because, you know, if we're going to go forward anywhere in, and be successful in terms of conservation and conserving, we need to have people on board. And so mm -hmm. using all the contacts I've had around the world through the bird fairs, you know, accessory like that, I thought with Penny, how can we create um, some sort of global website? And we came up with Global Birding. Dot org. So in order to launch this, I thought, well, again, what, we need to get people out in the field. We need to get people engaging with the birds that they're now growing to love. And so I came up with the idea of, well, why don't we just get people going out for a whole weekend? You know, what? why not? But how do you actually then record? So I thought, well, I've got great friends with uh, eBird, e, uh, Chris Wood and Ian Davies from, uh, from eBird in Cornell, University. Mm -hmm. And so I spoke to them. They said, well, this sounds great. We're actually doing a similar event and have done for a year or two called the October Big Day. And I said, well, look, can we partner? Can we get together on this? Absolutely. They have been amazing. So we said, right, well, they only do one day. We're going to do two days and we're going to link together with you guys. And they're absolutely fine. And now already we've got 57 countries from across the planet 
already registered and every day two or three new countries are coming in. We've got thousands of people. What we're really going to be doing is having a most wonderful weekend. We want it to be fun. We want teams to take part already. Uh, our partners like Sorosky uh, are going to be setting up a team. Rock Jumper Holidays are setting up teams. But the great thing about you guys, you can set up your team. Why not have a, a Birders Channel TV program? Because you can go out, Chris, uh, DA, you can go out, but you don't have to be together. You can form your teams. And uh, so long as you input that uh, information of the birds you see around Colombia, you've got a great opportunity. Make a film of this. This could be a wonderful opportunity to do something for the new channel. So I challenge you. I challenge you here now. <laughs> I challenge you here now. Challenge, challenge accepted. I was just about to say to Diego. So, why not? Why not? Where? where... Where, 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 where are you going to be, Chris, actually? Where do you want to go with? Yeah, absolutely. I, I was just about to suggest that we should um, we should set up a birders show uh, global bird weekend team here. And I can go out with Julian, yeah. our videographer for the show, who's a hardcore birder as well, who filmed those masked ducks that you saw earlier. And we can go out around the Bogota Savannah, look for Bogota Rail, maybe Apollinar's Wren, hopefully the masked duck, if they're still there at that time, get some of those endemic species in. That's an important an important set of species we can represent here. And Diego, you can go out around your area. You have two endemics in your garden, right? Yeah, I could just go around my, my place. And actually, that's what we are doing. Uh, Red-bellied grackles and Colombian chachalacas, chestnut wood quails. And one of the days, uh, I'm also going to be part of one of the, you know, sub teams from Swarovski for a live uh, transmission. Actually, Tim, where are you going to go birding on that day? Is it Rutland? Is it your home? <laughs> it has to be Rutland. There's nowhere else. <laughs> We've got to be tied to our um, social media all day long. But uh, to the roots, to the roots. We're yeah. calling us. We're calling ourselves the Rutland lockdowners because, of course, we were locked down. You know, <laughs> to our window. And for everybody watching right now, you'll be able to find all the information about how to sign up for the show, all the links down below in the description. And no, we'll absolutely be taking part here from Colombia. Uh, the Bird is show global bird weekend team good team so we've been we've been hearing from you about all these weather quests and i guess you might be a little biased about this but which is your birding dream destination like if you could go tomorrow to your you know dream place for birding what would that be and would that be connected to you know ducks or geese or any water birds my dream country has always been argentina i've been there a few times now and i love it because it's so diverse you know, you can be up in the uh, Midsones area in the jungle and you can go be down in Tierra del Fuego, almost on the edge of the, um, of the continent. And, of course, what I can't quite see there is the South Georgia pintail um, when I reach out. Uh, so that's my dream destination would be to go down to Tierra del Fuego, get the boat, go to um, the, South Georgia, and hopefully just divert a little bit further down into Antarctica to get me a few penguins. <laughs> <laughs> divert just a little bit. That's a cool, that's a cool destination. That sounds like a, a good trip, a good trip. Um, I also believe, Diego, you have uh, an audience question that you wanted to ask Tim. Oh, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Actually, a, a pretty cool one because uh, Tim knows this person from the audience that asked the question is Carlos Mario Wagner. Uh, he's actually the director of the Colombia Bird Fair here in Colombia. And, you know, Tim, Carlos Mario was was wondering something that a lot of us have, you know, been, been asking about a lot of time ago. And is Colombia has now the Colombia Bird Fair and many, many other tiny festivals and fairs and events about, you know, promotion of birding and birds per se. And this is beautiful and educates a lot of people and brings brings people, you know, together and connected with nature. But how do you think all these festivals are, you know, for good or not very good for promoting Colombia as a, as a you know, tourism destination for bird watching? Like, do we have too many festivals already? Should we, you know, tweak and model something? What do you think about all these, all these beautiful paraphernalia of, of festivals we have yeah. here? Well, obviously, Carlos is a good friend of mine. And, uh, you know, I, I, he's always said that our bird fair in the UK inspired him to set up the Cali Absolutely. Bird Fair. And, you know, I've been very proud and uh, be, to being a patron of that. Um, I I'm, I'm, uh, very much believe that initially all these bird fairs have got to focus on local people. 
Um, I mean, Colombia is mm -hmm. just a, a wonderful place because it's a relatively small country with the largest bird population in the world. So, you know, it's a great target country for people to visit. But it's engaging with people. And what I loved particularly about the bird fair um, in Minizales, I think it was, or was it Cali, was when you actually took the people into the supermarkets and or into the malls, or malls I think you call them, and uh, you <laughs> engaged with there. That was just a, a massive uh, uh, hit. In fact, it was Minizales because I remember there was the most wonderful picture of one of my favorite ducks, the torrent ducks, and both ducks were leaning over, almost touching beaks. So Penny and I took a picture of ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to finish off with a round of quick fire birding questions for Tim. We've asked a lot of people questions like this, and we just want to get, this is the first thing that pops into your head. So we want to just oh find out. <laughs> so think, you can think for a second before you answer. Okay, so, right. Uh, favorite bird and why? Uh, it's going to be the shoveler. Uh, the northern shoveler, because it, you see the way they feed, they go round and round in circles, never get anywhere, <laughs> and I'm a bit like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason. Okay, um, I'm sure you'll have a good answer for this one. Your nemesis bird. Ah, well, you see, I'm afraid it's got to be the pink-headed duck. I've got to go back and prove that I actually wasn't sort of on some sort of drug trip or something, but I did actually <laughs> see this bird. So, yeah, it's got to be the pink-headed duck and back to Myanmar or wherever this elusive bird is hiding from me. <laughs> okay, and on a slightly different note, your dream bird. The dream bird... Well, mm, that, and again, uh, there's got to be something really... It's, I, I, I'm going to go for Spectacle Eider because I just love that bird. And, you know, having reared the thing, actually had a, a, an egg in my hand and having a little chick in my hand at Slimbridge um, and yet never seen the thing in the wild. And I want to see it... The, mm. When I see it, I want to see those big flocks you see out at sea, not one sort of bedraggled female on a tiny, <laughs> dirty pond... Uh, you know, somewhere in Alaska. I want to see the real thing, a bit like our Orinoco geese. If you're going to see these birds, <laughs> yeah. see them in natural habitat and uh, in, in big numbers. Just love it. I, I have one there, Chris. I have, I, have, I have one just there, like uh, lifer ducks, if you see the male and female, or if you see the female, you count it, or you need to see the male. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'd love it. <laughs> I'd love to see the male. <laughs> I think I've managed to see the males of all the ducks. Um, and of course, you know, knowing my luck, I'll arrive when they're in eclipse blooming. So that would be... Uh, you know, the, the, the... Understood. Understood. I think, I think Diego's only asking that question because his masked ducks yesterday were only females. He just needs oh, you to, no. to, to ratify that <laughs> he's okay to it. check them I'm off his list. It. That's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy. Okay, so next question. Next question. Um, so you can only go birding in one place for the rest of your life. Where do you choose? Rutland Water. Oh, it's got to be Rutland Water, you know. Rutland Water. <laughs> I had a feeling that might be the answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, local patch, local patch. If everybody in the world birded their local patch as extensively as, as you've birded yours, then we'd have a lot more bird records around the world. Um, okay, <laughs> favorite country. Favorite country outside of your home country for birding? Uh, well, again, I think I would, it's either got to be Colombia, and I'm not just saying that because we're talking about Colombia, it's just <laughs> a lot of birds in Colombia that I haven't seen. And again, the diversity mm -hmm. is great. So I'm going to, I'm going to put Colombia at the top of that list. And the Fantastic. people, and the people. Good people. Uh, well, good people. Yeah. <laughs> most, most of them, Diego. <laughs> no, I With a few notable and, exceptions. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I tell you what, seriously, I mean, the people I've met in Colombia have been just amazing, absolutely remarkable. And, uh, you know, I've made such good friends there. And, uh, you know, I, I'm I just, you know, it's like a second home almost. Well, you're welcome back anytime. I say that as an honorary Colombian, not an actual oh, Colombian. Yeah. <laughs> and final question for you, Tim. Uh, binoculars, eight or ten? Oh, tens, of course. Of course. You see, Diego and I are in the eight camp, I think, over uh, here. So we yeah, can have a whole other yeah. debate Bear in on mind, that. You see, you're OK. You do a lot of your forest birding. So eights are much better, yeah. I guess, in the forest. Whereas for me, I spend a lot of time looking at waterfowl. So I just need that little bit of extra magnification. 
uh, for waders. Um, I mean, I agree. Yeah, forest birding makes it a little bit difficult, you know, with with tens, but yeah, you know, it's still it would still always be my favourite. So I'll go for tens. Okay, well, so on that note, I think it's time to say to you, Tim, thank you so much for joining us on The Birdie Show. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on and reminiscing about our experiences together. And um, hopefully we'll have some more in Colombia in the not-too-distant future. Brilliant. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure just to see you two guys again, but also to take part in this show. You know, I think it, this is a, a real novel way of uh, getting people around the world engaged through something that's friendly. You, you get a lovely feel. The minute sort of your smiling faces come on the show, you know, it's just a, a great opportunity. And I you know, congratulate everyone, uh, Greg and Daniel and Camilla, of course, you know, for the, for the patience you've all shown me. So um, thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> Hopefully we'll see you again. Absolutely. And for everybody watching, um, don't forget to go into the description and register for globalbirding.org for the Global Bird Weekend. We'll be there taking part as a team from The Birders Show. And uh, just to finish off, Diego, thanks as ever for joining me from Medellin. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks, thanks, you know, to team for being here. Absolute pleasure. And Chris, mate, see you in the next episode. Absolutely. See you in the next episode. And you go out and find that male masked duck just so you can really count it, okay? I'm not suffering. I'm not suffering. <laughs> you know, I, I, I can see it on the book. <laughs> Thank you for watching The Birder Show. I hope you enjoyed this episode. We've got plenty more coming for you in the future with some really exciting special guests from all different fields of birding. As ever, don't forget to like this video, subscribe, and make sure to hit the bell to get all the notifications of the exciting new content we've got coming your way bird related. And don't forget to take part in the Global Bird Weekend the 17th and 18th of October. <laughs>